This podcast includes explicit content. Listener discretion is advised. I'm a huge podcast fan. Like I'll, I don't even listen to music anymore. I just listen to podcasts. <laughs> It's hard to get through the day without somebody recommending a podcast. And that's great because podcasts offer the freedom to have some of the conversations our culture is missing. Could a podcast also enable more open conversations about sex? We think so. So we started the Estes podcast. For today's episode, we picked four of our favorite podcasters to discuss what it means to talk about sex. Sex is everywhere. We're made out of sex. So it has to be in everything. It's absolutely in everything some of the challenges of making a podcast and the profound things we've learned. I say like a lot. I'm trying to teach myself not to say that so much. What it's like to work with your partner. I keep thinking about maybe pitching an article like, you know, 10 times we nearly got divorced over our sex podcast. (laughs) How talking about sex means you might think about it a little differently. And, and, and then ever since Brady set, like brought that up, every time I'd have my mouth like wrapped around a nipple, I now think about it a little bit differently. And all the other things that go along with podcasting. Is my sound okay? My window's open. Should I close it? Can you, uh, Brady, can you be a little more projective? Um, I have a right about now. There's, there's like two people with leaf blowers outside right now. It's our most meta episode yet. The Sex Podcast Podcast. The Podcast. Welcome to the latest episode of The Ersties Podcast. I'm your host for today, Olivia Rose, and joining me are... Paulita Papel, Lina Bembe, Pandora Pasmo. Is everybody excited for today's Sex Podcast podcast? Yeah. Yes, always. Ooh, it's the biggest one yet. So shall we start off by talking about what motivated us to do The Ersties Podcast? Well, I think if we're very honest, we basically were just having these kind of conversations and it just felt so good. And then we felt our conversations were so transcendental and crucial that we might as well share them with the world. (laughs) Yeah, I think we already have shared so many adventures of the microphone, being naughty and just going around. So it's just about, it's another dimension of just being ourselves with a microphone in front of us. And on top of that, it has been a great experience to be able to talk to people that we find very interesting and to continue learning more things about uh, sex, pornography, and the science of sluttiness. And yeah. It's like we're having an open relationship in our podcast, really. (laughs) (laughs) So talking of open relationships, what happens when you decide not only to open up your marriage, but to start a sex podcast too? We are Bridie and Jeremy. Um, We're a married polyamorous couple, and our podcast is called Turn Me On. Bride and Jeremy post intimate conversations with episode titles like The Five Cardinal Rules of Butt Play and The Year of My Vagina. I wanted to know what made them decide to start a podcast. A few years ago, Bridie and myself, we decided to open up our marriage. We've been married for seven years now, and uh, we decided to dive into the world of polyamory. And when we decided to make that transition, we noticed that a lot of our friends, a lot of the people in our lives are really fascinated by that. And they they came to us with questions. They wanted to know what was that lifestyle like? Why did we choose to do that? How does it all work? What are the rules? And naturally, Bridie just kind of said, well, if everyone's coming to us to ask about this stuff, why don't we just hop on some microphones and talk about it together and put it out to the world? When you listen to the Turn Me On podcast, it's clear that this couple has excellent communication, which only strengthens their on-air discussions with each other and guests. But many couples would struggle to work together, let alone make their private conversations public. And we tried uh, a couple times before we actually released anything to the world. We had a couple of failed attempts. I think our first couple stabs at it were actually... They always ended in a fight. We would just end up fighting. I had this fight with my boyfriend about whether or not lovers can learn things from each other and um, like the problems that that presents and the difficulties, you know, and being vulnerable in that kind of way or just exposing your short temper if you happen to have one when you're trying to learn something new. As adults, I think we do that a lot, but um, I definitely, definitely pushed back on Jeremy a few times when we started because he had this, he was this experienced podcast host and he was giving me like feedback or like notes. 
And every, my response was like, fuck you, you know, <laughs> even though he was probably right in, in a lot of ways. But I remember the day, Jeremy, when you were like, you know what, let's just try it again. I won't give you any notes. We'll just do it. You do it your way. You don't have to do X and Y and Z. And um, we kind of found our way through that. And I don't know what feedback he would give me today if he could, but I'm not asking. So. And then I'm not telling. <laughs> Jeremy also hosts a podcast called Sick Boy and feels that sex, like sickness, is not something society is so open to talk about. I live with cystic fibrosis, and uh, I feel pretty strongly that talking about illness is something that we, for whatever reason, have decided as society is something that we, we shouldn't do. It's a taboo subject. We get weird when we talk about illness. And Bridie and I also feel like we, we do the same thing when it comes to talking about sex or sexuality. We're definitely all too familiar with sex being a taboo subject, but perhaps podcasts can really change that. I think there are a lot of people that want to consume, you know, like entertainment that's sex related. That's not necessarily hardcore pornography. I find that a lot of people also are more comfortable talking about the podcast. So like rather than being like, hey, I was just masturbating to you. They can be like, hey, I really enjoy your podcast. <laughs> Um, but I, I, I like that. I like talking to people. So like any way to like get people more comfortable and, you know, I could talk about sex forever. So as I Kira is a porn performer, entrepreneur, author, and the host of the porn hub podcast. She's been breaking taboos for some time now. So I was walking down the street one day and this guy just like came up to me and he was like, do you want to be in the adult entertainment industry? And I was like, yes, I do. Like I, I, can't believe this is happening to me. I felt, I felt like probably how most girls feel like being discovered for like a guest ad. I was like always so fascinated by like hookers and strippers and just like people in the sex world or even just sluts. Like I just loved sluts. One of the reasons we decided to create the Ursi's podcast is to reveal the insights and experiences of women in sex work. We asked other podcasters if they think that it's useful to hear perspectives on sex from porn performers. And at the same time, I also really want the world to see, you know, the people in porn or the people around porn or somehow related to sex. And I just kind of want to like show people that like, like, Hey, we're like real people too, with real thoughts and personalities. And I don't know, to me, I I've just always been interested in that. So I thought maybe other people would too. Connor is an ex-porn performer, lecturer, writer, and podcaster. I asked Connor, who wrote the essay, What I Want to Know is Why You Hate Porn Stars, which I really recommend for you to read, whether he, like Asa, thought his podcast had helped to humanize porn performers. Porn performers offer more of humanity to everybody by making porn. You know, it's like when you show something that for some, well, for many um, horrible reasons has been amputated from human experience, you're making more of humanity available to people. Um, and unfortunately, porn performers end up bearing the burden of that in a way that, in fact, many other sex workers who do not do porn actually don't um, because y y you're doing it publicly um, and you're doing it in an unerasable, unconcealable way. Um, and I think that that's something that porn performers offer everybody. It's making everybody more human. But the sort of weird inverse property of that is that then people see porn stars as less human. Against Everyone with Conor Habib is self-described as a countercultural podcast and web series about being human and all the ideas that go along with that. It's a show about radical philosophy, the occult, sexuality, science, literature, and much more, really. It's like my natural sort of my tendency to be like re resisting everything I hear, you know, everything that's told to me until I understand it myself and also resisting political power and oppression and all that kind of stuff. And on the, uh, the flip side, the dual meaning, you know, the other side of that dual meaning is that, uh, you know, I'm against everybody. I'm, I'm, I'm hugging them. I'm pressed up against them. Mm. And so that's I think, sweet. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's like that's the, that's the actual against that I aspire to in a way is mm -hmm. is touch.
So we finally have a sponsor. And this is none other than Erstis. That's right. The Erstis podcast sponsored by Erstis. Who would have thought it? This means if you want to see what our day job looks like, then head to erstis-podcast.com slash erstis. That's E-R-S-T-I-E-S. Check out the video and follow the link and you'll receive 50% off your first month. Please note that the content is 18 plus. One last time, erstis-podcast.com slash erstis. Click the link, 50% off your first month. And you must be over 18. Now, back to the pot. It seems that podcasts are a great place to discuss taboo topics like sexuality, sex work, unconventional relationships, and connect listeners to much broader conversations than they might usually come across. All the podcasters we spoke to felt we were missing some integral conversations. My favorite thing in the world is like listening to a podcast and crying. <laughs> <laughs> some of the episodes are really good and like really heartfelt stories. And I don't know. I just, I, I like that. I like empathizing with people and like hearing other stories. Connor Habib has a particularly interesting take on why real conversations matter. You know, a conversation really can offer something deep and profound to people, nourishing to people. For me, I think real conversations are stifled again and again. I think that whether I'm on a podcast and I'm talking about something and the conversation gets rerouted right at the minute, I think it's going to get interesting. Or mm -hmm. if I'm at the dinner table and I want to talk about something serious and people are like, oh, it's Friday night. Why are you bringing that up? Or just keeping things on this sort of clever, small talk uh, level. I think that people are really malnourished. And I think that people I notice really long to have real conversations. One podcaster finds the kinds of conversations possible in podcasts allow us to have more inquisitive conversations about sexuality. Mm -hmm. I actually think that meandering around a subject is something that is really important. Frankie Cogney is another host that's decided to start a podcast with her husband. Her podcast is called The Second Circle, which has a journalistic focus on sex in society based on what's happening in the news. That's really one of the key reasons that I started doing it, because the thing with journalism is that the, there isn't always that much room for nuance, because um, I felt like there were lots of things I wanted to talk about, but maybe not really answer. Or, you know, to just talk about possibilities uh, and maybes and just for there to be room for uncertainty. Unlike conversations with Asa Akira and, well, our podcast, The Second Circle seems to have more conservative audiences in mind, inviting those that might find certain news scandalous to be a bit more curious. So, for example, one thing I really want to do soon is um, have somebody on to talk to me about um, BDSM and specifically like daddy dom little girl relationships. Uh huh. I don't know if you saw, but there was a news story in the UK recently, uh, mm -hmm. basically a kind of sex scandal. MP was exposed as having had one of these relationships with a woman that he met kind of on social media. And it was an affair. Um, so he was married and it was on the side. Um, so there's that element, but people were just absolutely going crazy about the fact that they'd had this very kinky relationship and he was, you know, sending her text messages saying, oh, daddy wants this, daddy wants that. And people were totally grossed out by this and going, oh, it's, you know, it's fucked up, <laughs> it's messed up, it's wrong. And I felt like I really strongly disagree with that, but I personally have not had a relationship like that, so I can't speak with authority on it. So I really want to get somebody to come on to talk about actually what it feels like to be in that relationship, how the dynamic works. While you could say that Asa Akira assumes a certain level of, um, let's say, worldliness, but also strives to learn more about the unknown. And then I really loved talking to this guy named Double Dick Dude. He has two dicks, and that's something I knew nothing about. How common is the double dick thing? <laughs> really not very common. He told me it was like what there's like maybe like 11 people on earth or something, but it's, he's the only one that he knows of where like, so his, his two dicks are like side by side and they're like both normal looking dicks. Um, whereas I, I guess it's, it's a condition called diphalia. And most of the time, most people with diphalia, it's like, it doesn't look that 
it doesn't look like two perfect dicks. It looks like one normal dick and one like your stomach's inside out or something. So within that rare case, he's like the rarest. We also get straight to a point in our sex podcast. Well, Frankie told us. I felt like Esty's podcast is, I love it, but I feel like if you were new to some of those ideas, it could maybe be a bit like, oh, wow, okay, yeah, they really got into talking about this stuff pretty quickly. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, oh, geez, we're talking about squirting already? You're like, I only just started. <laughs> Our premature squirting aside, Frankie makes a good point about including more people in the conversation and that sex podcasts like Sex Positivity isn't just for sluts that have it all figured out. This could be, I just recorded one, for example, about actually what it's like to have low sex drive because I feel some concern that maybe people assume a sex podcast is only for you if you're having loads of sex, adventurous sex and like loads of partners and doing loads of kink. And I want to kind of make sure people realize that actually like sex positivity is for everybody. It's just about being chill with what you want to do mm -hmm. and there's no pressure. You don't have to meet the above criteria to be a sex podcaster or listen to a sex podcast, but do you need to be a sex educator? Like, I don't see myself as a sex educator, but I do think like people end up learning about sex from me and porn and the podcast and Pornhub and just watching porn. But like, I, I don't know. I struggle with that because like, I'm not, I've had a lot of sex and I know a lot about sex from personal experience, but I'm also like not qualified <laughs> to be teaching people officially about anything. But I think I, I wish, I wish like we had better sex education. Cause then, you know, I think a lot of times the first thing a, a child will learn about sex is from porn now. And I think if there were more open and honest education and conversation about sex outside of hardcore pornography, like I think, it would be better. Like a kid's first exposure to sex shouldn't be a gangbang. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I, not that I think there's anything wrong with a gangbang. I love gangbangs, but I got to learn that I love gangbangs. You know what I mean? Like I, I never thought like that's what sex is all the time. It's funny that in all these uh, cases, like none of these podcasters claim themselves to be experts in what they do. For the case of Connor and Asa, they're both part of the porn industry. And Frankie, she's a journalist who just claims to be curious enough about these topics. And then uh, Bridie and Jeremy from Turn Me On, they're just like a super charismatic couple who decided to share how they live their sexuality and their preferences that make very a lot of people are curious about them. I'd say the issue is that there is such a lack of dialogue and communication and conversation around sex in society that that's why also this, even if these are not expert conversations, this is so important to just have those conversations, not from an expert point of view, but just as a way of encouraging people to talk openly about sex without feeling shameful, without feeling bad about it. I feel like these podcasts are really important for me personally because every time I come here, every month, I'm learning something new every day because we're just talking about sex, whether it's something very, very platonic, like we're holding hands or, yeah, like you put a finger in me without asking. I don't know how I feel about this. <laughs> like, you know, I think it's really important that we're just talking about it in general because we right. don't talk about it at all. And it doesn't have to be, I had this amazing sex yeah. and doing lots of things. It can be, I'm struggling with this. Yeah, or... exactly. Yeah, I think uh, people sometimes just need validations for their insecurities, for the things that they don't know, for the things they wish they could just like talk about to others, but they, they just can't because like sex is like such a taboo. And there are like also so many different levels upon which you, which you can like talk about sex. It's not only about... Uh, genital contact it's not only about flirting it's not only about hooking up but there's just like so many dimensions that you could discuss about sex and it's not necessary to always have an expert to tell you what to do because then you think oh my god there's something that i'm doing wrong and who's doing this perfectly in any case like i think you ladies give me so much information about my emotional side as well when it comes to sex because i think that's something that we don't talk about It's like, oh, sex is a physical thing. It's like, what about the emotional things that go along with it? 
and just talking about it with you it makes me feel better and listening to other people's podcasts makes me feel better about it as well like we're not alone we're not alone oh. in our sexual escapades <laughs> right <laughs> I think podcasts have really allowed us to tell mm. more vulnerable and personal stories in a way that you couldn't through most other outlets. I really respect all the podcasters that we have on today and they're so vulnerable on their podcasts. So it's really nice. As an increasingly popular medium, it's no wonder podcasters are facing similar challenges to writers where you put a piece out there and you get that question. You know that thing you said, was that about me? It can be tricky to tell the authentic stories we want to share about our own lives without compromising the other people in it. You know, I'm in a relationship with someone else and out of, you know, respect for his wishes, I don't I don't talk candidly about that and I would love to, but I've had to really do a lot, a lot of talking and negotiating around what's okay to talk about and what's not okay. And like, I remember one time, for example, I had an irregular pap test and I wanted to talk about it on the podcast. And my partner's concern was, well, you know, the, the line of logic is like, if you have an irregular pap test, you, you know, you, you probably come into contact with, um, what is it? HPV. HPV. And then everyone will know that I've come into contact with it. And it's like, well, okay, 70% of Canadians have come into contact with it. We've all come into contact with it. And I felt really like I don't want to throw him under the bus in this because, but the conversation was really like, well, up to what extent is it up to me to decide what I want and can say about my own body? And then, you know, we live in a small town. So, so that it's like, well, who's she, who else is she sleeping with and blah, blah, blah. And it just gets so that's, that's a bit tough. I do think it's really powerful to hear from real people. Mm -hmm. And I do think, you know, people have said to me, like, it's really nuts to hear a real couple talking about... Actually, to be honest, we don't talk in great detail about our sex life. We kind of refer to things that happened in the past, maybe, to our general views that would give you a a view of our sex life. But we don't really talk about, like, what we do. That's partly because it's not Rob's field. Uh Uh-huh. And so he has a... His boundaries there are probably tighter than mine. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But it's also something that I'm working on because I do think it's important to share your own experiences because it helps other people realise either they can relate to them or they really can't relate to them and that they learn something about themselves that way. What came up in many of our interviews was that it means a lot to tell personal stories and be vulnerable in your podcast. To ask an uncomfortable question, ladies, what do you feel about expressing vulnerability and sharing details about your private lives on the podcast? It's a, I think it's a very complex question that's not have a simple answer. Like, I think it also starts already in social media. Like, I'm not the kind of person that would post, like, what I had for dinner today because I don't find that too relevant for anyone else. Uh, but I did start at some point to comment on whatever was happening in my life and the encounters that I would have and also especially the sexual encounters and I felt it felt very empowering when I was doing it but then when someone else did it about me I felt I felt a great discomfort like my privacy was not anymore in my hands and it had gotten out of control so I think it's tricky because whereas I feel it's very important to be honest and share stories it's also a matter of consent on what other people uh, you know on their privacy yeah, it's it's really tricky because I think that in general there we have not too many spaces in which we can show ourselves as vulnerable sexual creatures. And of course there's no single safe space anywhere in which we can be our sexual beings without any potential risk of being challenged in constructive ways, but also without being bullied. And especially if you're somehow a a sex worker or someone who's like really open and frontal about their sexuality. But at the same time, it's, um, I personally find it very healing. I find it something that makes me feel more strong about who, how I see myself and about who I, how I live my sex life. And, and I don't know, I think it's also 
besides like the personal retribution of, of being like open and honest about your sexuality I think that also people appreciate that and it also encourages other people to be a little bit more um confident about their own sexualities or about like sharing things in, in ways they think more convenient Absolutely, I do agree with you. I feel as uh, having a dissident sexuality or identity, you're being silenced and we tend to censor ourselves for the sake of, you know, not putting ourselves at risk and actually having this space where we can be open, where I do not have to justify all the time who I am and what I do, but I can just actually have a conversation on it. I also think it's about, it's not just about sex, it's anything private or personal. I think it's quite hard to find conversations that get past that small talk level and get to the point you know, of asking the question that you really want to ask somebody, but how did it feel when you did that? And weren't you worried about, you know, just get into more detail with people. And I think that's really important when you have a podcast, because it's about telling stories and to tell a story properly, you have to describe the details. We can generally sort of be like, oh yeah. And then I did these things at the weekend, but for someone to really connect with that, you need to tell a little bit more. And then I think you can make a more object you can have a more objective view on the story being told because you've sort of seen it you're not just taking my word for it even if it's just about how many fingers you know <laughs> yeah and it's more visceral you're like oh yeah the fingers in the room <laughs> uh, Connor was saying before how we it's so important that we humanize ourselves because what we are on social media is one thing and I feel like I agree this is a this is some sort of media of course doing a podcast but it's really important that we connect with the people by being human and like showing your vulnerable side is it, you will gain so much more than you will lose, I feel. Asa has possibly a few more listeners than we do. So if she's sharing vulnerable personal details, a lot more people are going to hear about it. It's hard for me to not be vulnerable and honest on the show because like, I mean, you guys know how it is when you talk so much, it's like, eventually you have to talk about your personal shit and you have to like talk about the unflattering things too, because there's too much time to fill with just good things. <laughs> As part of the Pornhub podcast, Aza Kira recently devoted an episode to discussing her pregnancy on air with her husband, going into detail about talking to the child about their mother's career, whether Aza will continue to work during her pregnancy, and why she feels it's only fair that her husband let her peg him since she's birthing their baby. In short, Aza is one of the most open podcasters around. The episodes I do with my husband are super vulnerable because on one hand, I have this audience that I know wants to fantasize about me as this like available woman. And I think when your job is sex, people get really confused when when you mix motherhood with sexuality and myself included. I think like I have my own internal battle with that. But like at the end of the day, I was like, you know what? Fuck it. Like just because I'm going to have a kid, it doesn't make me not a sexual person. I'm still a woman. That's how I got pregnant. I'm going to continue being a sexual person. So I, I don't want to have to sacrifice that. So in that, that's like a very different kind of vulnerability because it could be affecting my money, my business, my brand. Um, so that's always scary, but you know, I, I'm also kind of at the point where I'm like, I've been doing porn for 10 years. I think I've earned it. <laughs> and also like, it's hard to be half honest about my life. Like I either have to reveal everything or nothing at all. And I would rather reveal everything. For many, the personal disclosure element is a big challenge of podcasting. Though practical things like funding, time, resources, and sound quality all play a big role in making a podcast happen. One thing you might not know about podcasts is it's actually super hard to track listens across all the platforms. So we think we're talking to lots of people. I mean, we assume we are. I don't know how to get more listeners exactly. You know, it's like I have a lot. I have a lot already. But, okay, so this is a technical thing, but you know this with podcasts, you can't ever know how many people are listening, right. which is crazy because you're on so many different platforms and they all have different tracking things. So even if you run it through like one thing, you actually don't know how many people are listening to the podcast. And that is, that's a really, that's, that's not like selling a book, you know, like, or whatever, where you can pretty directly see at least 
to a reasonable extent how many people are paying attention to the thing that you're doing. Many podcasts like Against Everyone, The Second Circle, and Turn Me On rely on funding from Patreon. So if you've subscribed to these podcasts or simply enjoy them, don't forget to support them. So we've talked about including personal stories and vulnerability in our podcasts, but how does it impact life outside the podcasts? What effect, if any, has the podcast had on our personal relationships and sex lives? I feel like my friendships are much better. Really? How? Just because I'm, instead of looking at people for their potential or like uh, looking at friendships for where they could be fixed, because that's how I was thinking before, like everyone should better themselves. I was like, no, you should just love them for who they are, for all their kinks, if you want to go on a deeper relationship with them, or just like generally how people are sometimes. Like some people just don't want to answer their phone or something. So you're like, okay, that's how you want to be, work around it. Uh, like for me, it's a sort of extra layer of um, could be knowledge because there are like some podcasts that are like very focused on scientific facts about sex, uh, but there's also like this other layer of uh, validation. And even though I'm really, I, I think I'm really privileged and really fortunate to be surrounded by a group of friends who are really accepting and open about everything that comes like with sex and sexuality. I, I think there are like sometimes many things that you cannot always, I mean, you cannot always like discuss absolutely everything with the people who are close to you. I don't know, we're all just weird and there are some things that we keep for ourselves. And then we will still need to uh, figure out, you know, so when your therapist doesn't understand it, your partner doesn't understand it, or your friends, you feel like too kind of like shy to talk about it with your friends, like a podcast can be another option. <laughs> That's a really good point. I think, Palita, didn't you write an article on this recently? I did. And you can check it out on Girl on the Net blog. Um, yeah, actually writing an article made me think a lot about it. And I... Apart from what we just talked about, that we it is absolutely empowering to just have this space with you, uh, ladies, to be myself and be open and discuss all these topics. Um, so I think that empowerment translates into my private life uh, that in a way that it has helped me actually have more sincere and honest conversations with my partners um, in two ways. So first, just the empowerment, so me feeling more confident about these topics and learning how to express myself without trying to you know hide anything from me because I think that is one of the reasons that that makes communication fail when you're trying to have a conversation but you're still not opening up completely right Uh, so it has helped me like giving me the confidence to do that to put myself out there as a whole (laughs) in front of partners and at the same time um, having this podcast and having you know some listeners how many there are, we don't know, still also has put in me even more responsibility. And I, I feel it's made me more accountable. Uh, like I feel, you know, I'm talking about these things and I'm preaching uh, and then I feel like I really need to be coherent in my private life. So it has it has put pressure on me, but I think not in a negative way, but in a positive way of like actually becoming an adult and, a, and an accountable person. I'm not saying I'm there, but I'm saying it, It is helping me in the process of learning how to deal um, with all that communication and sexuality in my private life. I think in terms of the private, sometimes I forget that we're on a certain level, like we're speaking about it a lot. And sometimes I leave this situation, then walk back to my private life and think that they're on the same level. I've got all these exciting new ideas and curiosities and they're like, where is all of this stuff coming from? I guess they're not listening to the podcast. But I think it's it's a difficult, for me, I think it's a difficult thing to balance like an intellectual, (laughs) semi-intellectual interest in sex, talking about sex, having it as a subject and then having sex as part of your life and not always wanting those things to be confused. I don't want my sex life to turn into like oh, I was talking about this in the podcast and now I really want to try this thing and, and, you know, and just sort of neglect the reality of the thing. That's interesting. I don't feel that way, but maybe, uh, or possibly because that is what sex is for me, an anecdotal part of my life. Right. (laughs) 
<laughs> I'd say more of more of half of my sexual encounters are just you know for the laughs and for the yeah. for the exploration and for the uh, for this semi uh, what did you just call it <laughs> semi intellectual <laughs> semi intellectual conversation on it. Yeah, I think some I just worry. So I think sometimes I've risked losing connectedness over it becoming maybe almost a hobby. That's interesting cause because for me, I achieve more connection through having that layer integrated in it. Like I don't, the connection that I can get, you know, just by looking into each other's eyes. It's just not good for me. Like uh, it just fills me much more with fear and, uh, and anxiety uh, than if I can have that verbal level of communication with it. And it actually being just sex. It's, and you know, talking about it as that, it like, it does make it more real to me, if that makes sense. Because that's just how I apprehend it, or yeah. I feel like the said pop sex podcast has like helped me filter out a lot of shit people. <laughs> Sorry to be so <laughs> aggressive, but it's just like a very, like, you know, if the conversation comes up with a group of people, I can already tell who is going to ask me an intellectual question about it and who wants to just know, what are you talking about on there? What, <laughs> what's, what's, what, what's going on? Like, you know, really stupid questions about, oh, so like, what do the girls look like? I'm like, no, this is not the conversations I want to have with you. Go away. Like, it's just a good filter for me to be like, you're an idiot. You're an idiot. We can sit and talk. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe that's a bit too aggressive, but... I love that the podcast is doing that for you. That's what porn makes for me. That's what I was about to say. I yeah. think it's, that's like working in the sort of yeah. sex industry in general. You get quite an immediate impression of somebody from their yeah. response to that. Okay, that got pretty deep because this is our most meta episode <laughs> yet. <laughs> it seemed fitting to find out what the polyamorous married couple from Turn Me On had to say about this once they'd overcome those first few fights. The communication levels in this podcast couple are something to aspire to, both for good relationships and good podcasts. It seems like one might feed the other. Sex was something that, you, you know, we've we've always had a lot to talk about, but we haven't always talked about it. And um, in terms of our communication about sex, it didn't really measure up, I don't think, now that I'm thinking about it to the way we were able to communicate about a lot of other things. And then we started the podcast and I think a lot of our early conversations were revealing. I think I learned a lot about Jeremy and I I think he's probably learned a lot about me and who we are sexually by having these conversations on a microphone because I've never been shy about airing my dirty laundry ever. I will fight with you wherever and whenever you want as loud as I feel like it. And um, I, I think that sometimes inviting those little moments of tension, because sometimes we have a guest here as well, um, inviting those little moments of tension into conversation in a sort of a public way means that we're both really on guard to be respectful and sensitive, but also to see each other and where we can push each other a little bit outside of our comfort zones to, to say things that are personal and we may have never communicated before about. I remember the first thing I was nervous to ask about on the podcast and it was about, um, I don't remember if we had a guest or not, but I may have just asked Jeremy, but I said, uh, when you're ever having sex and you have your mouth on someone's nipple. Are you ever fantasizing about breastfeeding? Because it, it kind of had been a thing that was popping up a lot for me in the sex that I was having with other people. And I was really intrigued by it, but I didn't know how to like say that to the person that I was having sex with or like bring it up. And I just wanted to test the waters and see if that was like a common thing. And um, Jeremy was like, no. Yeah, absolutely. I was like, absolutely not. I've never. And, and, but I. But what's really funny is I. I love uh, sucking on a tit. Like that's my. That's like my favorite pastime. And and it's just a little suckle. And ever since Brody set like brought that up, every time I'd have my mouth like wrapped around a nipple, I now think 
about it a little bit differently. Connor Habib also shared with us how it changes your perception once you tune into the fact that sex really is in everything. Are you still learning new things about sex? Oh my god, yeah, every day. I mean, really every day. It's like uh, once you attenuate yourself to your desires and your attractions and repulsions in a certain way, those happen every day. So once you attenuate yourself to them, you start noticing them, you know, and you can't help but sort of think about them and and consider what's going on each time e each time you desire something and want something. I mean, I I don't think of sex as the act of sex. I think of it as something much broader. So to me, I'm always sort of noticing how it plays out in culture too. One thing that I've just found really surprising is how much you can you can really change the way that you perceive how relationships work and don't work. I think there's a lot to learn from all of our guests, both just about making podcasts. I feel like it was quite a good opportunity to just steal some tips from other podcasts. <laughs> yeah. I have a podcast crush. Uh, we have a lot of podcast crushes, actually. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Alita's still trying to recover from the we last We need another one. episode for podcast crushes. Oh, my God. I was going to say, um, I don't know what you're talking about, Jeremy, but then, Olivia, you totally explained it to me, so now I get it. <laughs> Maybe we should be in a relationship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you guys sound really cute together. Sure. I don't know. I feel like... Um, Possibly. <laughs> Since, uh, you know, we, I feel like our sexuality also has kind of shifted into this podcast arena. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe just like, you know, what for other people would be like talking about their sex life for us is talking about our sex podcast. So it felt like a very intimate conversation to have with these people. Uh, I, I, I mean, I, yeah, definitely completely fell in love with both Connor and Asa and talking to them. It was just some of the, yeah, it was definitely like, highlight of the week and like <laughs> it's uh yeah i don't know i don't know if you, you could go to, is that, does that go in a sapiosexual kind of way i've been thinking about i think it's the intimacy of that people being so willing to share things and be honest with you like i was watching wanderlust on netflix recently and the whole episode was just a therapy session but it was amazing acting and it was just so raw but i got really turned on It was really weird. Like the ultimate, like, see, people just like sharing with each other and like the ultimate truth being dropped. It was weird. Like maybe that is the sapiest. That's no. That's the ultimate vulnerability point. Yeah, it was like the ultimate vulnerability. Like, and I was just like, oh. And orgasm will collage. <laughs> That's like doing acid, or? Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> But you know how there's always a talk on this, I mean, in any art, in porn as well, but also in any art like dance and, and, and music and whatever, there's always a song that suddenly, or, you know, a song, a film, a, a podcast or something that just like, like pushes that whatever it is in my brain and suddenly, boom, I'm there like crying my eyes out. But there is something about ourselves always having to pull things back and not being able to be authentic in a lot of situations in our lives. And I think having something that shows that vulnerability and authenticity is what actually is so touching and sexy at the same time. <laughs> It's just like, for me, it has been an, um, like a new way of connecting with my work, with the things I like, um, to find out new people that are in a similar well, in a similar kind of industry, in other parts that uh, that I can feel like deeply connected to. I mean, there are like some, there are some podcasts that I find like really, really touching. The listener has to also connect with us and and the <laughs> listener can like look for us and they can do it in the comfort and the privacy of their own, um, of their own home. And because some people are isolated from that. Imagine if you're growing up in like some rural farm or something with only internet. It will be your best friend. <laughs> Absolutely agree. And not even that. I mean, you can be in a big city and be isolated. Yeah. And also what I'm thinking now is that we, the interesting thing about us having a conversation is we are actually, this is how I feel, creating a space where the norm is a different one. So we are actually, you know, 
proposing I'm gonna get pathetic and cheesy here no, <laughs> bear with me it. bear with Today. me I'm ready <laughs> I'm gonna cry we are proposing a better world you know what I mean we are proposing a space where um, where you know the norm, there's a different norm and there's different um, ways of communicating with each other so I think just creating this space for us and for the listeners it's proposing alternative realities that might work in the future That brings us to the end of our sex podcast podcast. We've certainly learned a lot about podcasting from making this episode. We'd love to know your thoughts, podcast listeners. Maybe you're interested in starting your own podcast, or you were just curious to know what goes through the minds of people that record themselves talking about sex and share it on the internet. Do share your thoughts by leaving us a comment on Twitter at Erste's Podcast, or write a review. We really do read and appreciate all of them. For more episodes... Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, SoundCloud, or wherever you like to listen. Before we end, we'd like to say a tremendous thank you to all the guests that appeared in this episode. Asa Akira from the Pornhub podcast, Connor Habib from Against Everyone, Frankie Cookney from The Second Circle, and Jeremy and Bride from Turn Me On. It wouldn't have been a sex podcast podcast without you. If you want to listen and subscribe to these awesome podcasters yourself, check out their info in our show notes. Bye. Ciao. The Earth Days Podcast.